Welcome to a new season of Leadership Live podcast, where talented people become extraordinary leaders. I'm Daphna Horowitz, and I'm here to help you cut through the noise and talk about real leadership issues, down-to-earth, solid, caring, and confident leadership. No theory, no pie in the sky, no frills or fluff, because this is what the world needs most right now, for you to lead with confidence, clarity, and impact so that you can build a business that builds people, grows profit, and makes a difference. Today, we're telling stories because storytelling is a skill that can be learned. We may think it's something that comes naturally to us because much of our communication is in the form of telling stories. But if we learn how to do this really skillfully, we can enhance our communication and with that, our impact. When we really clear on our message and can communicate it in a way that engages people, then we're using storytelling really, really well. And this has become a leadership skill because leaders need to engage their people. So today I'm speaking with Gabrielle Dolan, who is an expert at storytelling and has even done a stand-up comedy routine, which I think requires great uh, talent and skill and courage. And she shares that story with us. And even more than that, she shares with us some practical skills that we can immediately use to enhance our storytelling skills. And this is something that every leader should be aware of and starting to work on in terms of your skills in engaging and communicating with your people. Gabrielle is an author of numerous leadership related books. Uh, You can check the show notes for those. And she's a mom of two teenagers who help her keep life real and down to earth. So listen into this episode, make sure you have a pen and paper ready to take some notes and start thinking about your own skills in terms of storytelling. Enjoy. And as always, for great leadership resources and information about our events and programs, head on to my website at daphnahorovitz.com. And and if you haven't yet, grab yourself a copy of my book, Weekly Habits for Extraordinary Leaders, available on Amazon today. Write a review. Give me a rating if you've enjoyed it. It always helps. And one more question for you. Do you want to be a confident and inspiring CEO with a winning team rallied behind you? then ask me about our extraordinary CEO process that we are just, just about to launch and I'm very excited about. And I'd love to tell you more about that. So have a listen, enjoy and share it with a friend, leave a review and have a beautiful day. So today we have Gabrielle Dolan with us and I'm really excited. The topic is storytelling and how we can use this as a skill in leadership. Welcome, Gabrielle. Oh, thank you. It's so good to be here, Daphna. And Gabrielle, as you know, we were just discussing before I hit record, uh, storytelling is something that's spoken about a lot in the leadership context, in the organizational context, context, and I'm really looking forward to diving in deep today. And we laughed about the fact that often when we tell a story, we'll start with the kind of the boring details, right? So I was driving on this road and it was the I-25 that leads onto this thing. And there's a tree and you know that petrol station on the side of the road. and You're not getting to the story and you already people are getting tired just hearing those details. So like I've shared, I, I've climbed Kilimanjaro and the way I start telling my story is at the point of my breakdown where I couldn't take another step. I take you know, the audience to the toughest moment in the story because that's the, what draws people in. That's what people want to know about. So I'm going to pose the question to you, Gabriel. I know you've got a good story for us. So take us to that catalyst moment, that tough moment that you experienced and you want to tell us about today. Well, it was the moment when I um, decided to leave the corporate world and start my business. And I remember distinctly where I was. I was sitting in a meeting room and I was about to be told whether I had been lucky enough to get the job that I applied for, which was a pretty global senior role at one of Australia's largest banks. And um, I remember the woman just sat aside me. She was actually my manager, but I was I was going for a job in her new department. And she said, this has been one of the toughest decisions I've had to make, but I'm not offering you this job. And I was sort of, I, I felt devastated that because I sort of thought I would get it, but um, there was part of me that sort of went, oh, okay. And I remember her saying, and she told me, she told me all the reasons why I didn't get it. And then she said, what do you think you're going to do? And I said, 
I think it's time to go. I think it's actually time to go. And I still remember her leaning over the table and, you know, touching my arm and said, I think it's time for you to go too. And she said, you've actually been talking about, the, you know, starting your own business and, and doing your own thing for a, a year or two now. And she goes, why don't you go do it? And um, so I remember walking out and I, I rang my husband and it was very rare that we would ring each other during work. <laughs> and uh, he's going, what's wrong? I go, nothing's wrong. I, I've just, I've just decided to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to resign and I'm going to take the package and I'm going to, you know, go out on my own. And he went, oh, okay. He said, well, you know, knowing you, you've probably thought about it long and hard, so I'll support you. And I thought, hmm, haven't thought about it that long at all. But, <laughs> um, so maybe but it's I guess, part of the discussion but was never a reality and this yeah. moment actually brought it right in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. And, look, it, it, it's something being, you know, in my last couple of years uh, working in senior leadership roles at the bank, I'd sort of come across this concept of storytelling and I, I was sort of playing with it a bit and so it was sort of there um, and I knew I wanted to do something with it at some point and this was just the the loving push or the catalyst that that made me do it and uh, so here I am almost 17 years later. 17 years ago, amazing. Mm. Okay, so now I'm thinking 17 years ago, today we hear a lot about storytelling and it's become even a little bit of a, I think a buzzword in, in the field. However, 17 years ago it was probably quite a new type of concept or idea yeah it absolutely was so uh, literally when I would was leaving you know leaving the the corporate world and telling people so what are you going to do is like I'm going to start a business I'm going to teach leaders how to tell stories more effectively the looks I got (laughs) I can imagine the the (laughs) like people would seriously go what the, like what is what like what like this astounding why are you gonna tell teach people how to tell stories isn't this what we do all day like tell yeah stories? yeah so what it was a combination to storytelling how did how did you get involved in the whole concept yeah look it was probably a couple of years previously I again I so a couple of things I I was a senior leader and I I experienced firsthand the frustrations of when you communicate something and people don't get it, when you're trying to, you know, influence people to do something and they don't get it, when you're rolling out a new strategy or a change and they're not understanding it and you're going, "This, this makes such logical sense, why don't people get it? And I started to notice that when I started to share a bit of a personal story, people seemed to really connect with it and understand the message. I remember this was about 20 years ago. I was a chain, I was a change manager um, with uh, one of the early implementations of SAP. So 20 years ago, one of the very, very early implementations of SAP, which is a very long, it was like a two year longer project. And I remember when we uh, almost were going live, it was my job to go out to all the business units and, and teach them or, you know, communicate we're about to go live. And I started to play with this concept where, you know, you're expected to do a PowerPoint presentation. So the first slide I had was a picture of my daughter who was just about to turn two. And I put it up, go, this is my daughter, Alex. And um, I go, you know, she's cute, blah, blah, blah. And I was sort of talking to my, about my daughter for like about 15, 20 seconds, knowing that'd be going, why is she telling us about her <laughs> daughter? What is going on? <laughs> like, why, 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 why? And I, I just I just did it for about 20 seconds or so too. I could sort of see them thinking, why are you doing this? And then I said, just to help you understand how long this project has been going on, I started on this project when I was six weeks pregnant with Alex. And that, that it was like, people were, oh, my God. Now, if I had have just said this project's been going for you know, over two and a half years, it would have meant nothing. Yeah. But that really got it home. And, and you know, it's interesting, almost, well, 20, you know, Alex is nearly 21 in a few months. Amazing. I, I see colleagues that I work with then and they actually still ask me about Alex. How's so Alex? it's, oh, yeah, how's awesome. Alex? And, because people yeah. remember stories. People also remember, I find, how they felt in a situation. So when you are starting something and they're starting to question, you're already their brain is working in a different way and you're connecting them with something we can relate to, which is children or parenting or whatever it is. So they are going to remember that. They are. Gonna yeah, they, that. absolutely. And, and again, that's the power of stories. As, as humans, 
we're hardwired to tell stories and we're and we hardwired to listen to stories. We actually listen to stories differently. And the business world has just had this real bias towards facts and figures and yes. logic and data yes. and and don't not bring in any form of emotion. And that that bias is to our detriment. Because and of course you still need all the facts and figures and data and logic, but but when you're communicating with humans yeah. who are emotional beings and they connect to stories differently. Exactly. And what you said earlier, which I thought was so important and something that I see often, almost all the time, is when you said when you when leaders are trying to communicate something and their team or their people or their audience just doesn't get it. And I mm. can't tell you the amount of times I've spoken to leaders, CEOs, and they say, but I've said this to my team about a hundred times. How can they not know this? How can they not know what they are? I'll do a vision and strategy workshop. And people in the pre, you know, in the preparation questionnaire, I'll say, so what is the company's vision? Do you know what it is? And they'll all go, we don't know what it is. We need clarity. We need more. We need more information. And the CEO goes, but I speak about it all the time. How can they not know? How can they not get it? They often feel they're a hundred steps ahead of where they want their team to be and that their team's just not catching up. And I think that does boil down to the way that we communicate. We can say something, but how do we get people to get it, to hear it? Yeah, one of the things I talk about when I run training with leaders, um, I actually talk about the curse of knowledge as in, and we've all got it, we've all got yeah. it by default, as in we know we know our stuff really well. So, for you know, you, you think about it, you know, senior leaders work on the strategy and they've pro- they probably spend days and weeks and months discussing the strategy. So they know it really well. And then they go out with their beautifully crafted PowerPoint presentation <laughs> And, and get really frustrated why people don't understand it because they're personal knowledge. I also think there's a, there's a great quote from George Bernard Shaw and he says the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that has taken place. So we think we've communicated. Exactly. Yeah. One of, I love one of the curse of knowledge. I think that's yeah, so yeah. good because we if we've been running it through our heads a hundred thousand times, what seems we know obvious it. to us is just so not obvious and clear to the people around us because they haven't been in your head for all those hundred thousand times, you know. Exactly. And and you need to understand that that's the reality. And so when you're sort of as leaders that have this frustration of saying, but I've told them, we've, we've told them so many times, why don't they get it? And it's, it's really easy to say they're not listening, they're not paying attention. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. they don't care they don't get that's a very easy response but the reality is if you're the person communicating if you're the leader it's not their job to get it it's your job to help them get it so the pushback I do is like let's say that again because I think it's so important it is it is not their job to get it it is your job to help them get it and if you're sitting there saying but we have told them 10 times and they don't get it my challenge would be maybe tell them in a different way. Exactly. And instead of just going on and on and on again with the logic, because logic just informs people, right. it doesn't influence them and, it, and people don't connect it. So I say, why, Gabriel, don't, we ta- why don't you share a story? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and Gabriel, I just want to highlight that point even more, drill it even further, because it's not about what are they doing wrong that they're not hearing what I'm telling them. It's how can I change what I'm doing so that they hear it better or that they get my message or they understand my message. So let's maybe go into the practical side of it because I do have a question around storytelling and that is I'm thinking that a lot of people out there are thinking, isn't storytelling natural? Isn't it just something that we know how to do? Isn't it something that we all do? So I'd like a comment on that and then also let's go into, well, how, what skills do we need to do this well in, in the um, leadership context? Yeah, so on one hand, storytelling is natural. It's the way, as humans, we communicate. I, um, I've i actually just come back from uh, 10 days in Australia's Northern Territory. I'm, I'm from Australia, hence why I could come to Australia. And we don't have to look any further than Australia's First Nations people that have been sharing stories for over 60,000 years. And the messages have gone down tens of thousands of years all through story. So it's 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 in our DNA. It's the way we communicate. It's it's it is natural. But sharing stories in business isn't natural because of a lot of things. There's there's still a lot of people that think it's not professional to share stories yeah. like yeah. and, sh- and certain personal lives separate yep. from their professional life yep. and yeah we've, I think. we've all been told and we're being conditions works works personal personal don't mix the two just give me the facts i yeah, mean has anyone ever facts. in you 
Yeah. Has anyone ever in your career said, just give me the story? <laughs> no, no, it's not. So, so there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons why we don't even do it because we think it's not professional. There, there, there is a lot of people don't, you know, I'd have to share something personal. So it's showing a bit of vulnerability. So it's a bit of courage. They think people wouldn't be interested. They think it's self-indulgent. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of reasons why we don't do it. But most of the time it's we've been conditioned to, sh- to be see it's not professional. So, even though sharing stories is natural, sharing stories in business isn't. And there is a very, very di- big difference between sharing stories like, you know, with our friends over dinner and sharing stories right. in a professional situation. There is a very big difference. Right. And I want to talk about this difference because I think that's also important because I have been yeah. on the receiving end and I'm sure many people have where you are with someone who is a, what we do in a compulsive or incessant storyteller and all they do is tell their stories and stories and talk stories and that's also not what you want so so let's, exactly. yeah, let's look at that exactly yeah well let's start with that one okay. so there are people that just go like telling story after story after story with no reason for sharing the story except for them to just be <laughs> like loving the sound of their own voice. Um, so the first thing in business, like, you know, if, if we're in a if we're in a personal situation, you're just sharing story to share, you know, what did you do today? What did you do this week? You'll just share stories. In business, you've got to be clear on the on the key message you're trying to get across. So you've got to be clear on why you're sharing the story. Do you do you want to influence an outcome? Do you want them to understand something and and have one message like the amount of clients that come to me and say, can you help us develop our strategy story? I go, what, do you think you're going to communicate your strategy with just one story? Uh-huh. Like you're never going to do that. It's like how do you break the elements of the strategy down and have a story for each one of them? How do you have a story for each one of your values? How do you, you, you know, when I look at a company's strategy, it's normally maybe a new mission or purpose and a whole set of values and maybe a whole set of behaviours and a whole set of strategic pillars. Well, you need a story for each of those and at, mm-hmm. at least for each of those. So one that. message per story. You've got to be I really clear that. on why you're sharing the story. That's one of the main differences. Um the other thing too is you've got to find the right story for the right message. So again, some people That's a good one. <laughs> so some people share a story and then go, and the reason I'm sharing with you this is because of blah. And you go, really? Hmm, that seems like a very answer? long bow to draw. Like, and so, I have to jump in there because one of my favorite don't do's is when you want to share a story because someone's just shared a story with you and you have a similar experience so you just want to say oh yes this is what happened to me so there's no real reason for the story i love that you said think about why you are sharing the story and what is the outcome that you want to influence through sharing the story and don't let it just go into this distraction and digression of someone shared a story so you're sharing your own story and then you like yeah. just devolve into a conversation that doesn't actually get anywhere yeah exactly i mean do that do that with your mates over over drinks exactly. that's the whole life but not yeah so it's got to be so really clear really clear on your purpose um why you're sharing the story the other, I think the other big difference is it's got to be really succinct in business. Mm. So I, mm. you know, often, <laughs> often because we, know we go, <laughs> oh, we know, we know people that go on forever and ever. So we, storytelling has been tarnished because of those people. Yeah. Um, my, my rule, my bit of a guide I teach leaders is your story should be about one to two minutes. Um, in business, nice. there will come a time where everyone will start or people will start thinking, get to the point. And the moment someone starts thinking, get to the point, you have lost them. You're starting to lose them. So it makes sense. You want to be, you want to have your story well and truly finished before anyone is thinking, get to the point. Now, some people might be thinking that after one minute or two minutes or, you know, some people might think it after three or four minutes, but you want to be finished well before anyone's thinking that. So it's got to be really succinct. I will often have some people say to me, um, but I've got to give this presentation, but we only have five minutes each. That's all we've got. So I don't have time for a story. And I would go, well, the only thing you've got time for is a story. Yeah. Just, just like imagine if you've got five minutes, you just tell a story about why on the purpose. I go, people will then come back and want more information. But, you know, the biggest mistake we go, oh, five minutes, just let's try to cram as much logic into that as possible where 
you know, you, I would go, you know what, I only need two minutes and tell a story. It's yeah, just... it's true. I so agree with you because the truth is even in five minutes, what, what would tend to happen, I think uh, the, the, the thinking out there is we've got five minutes, let's cram as much information into that five minutes as possible. And actually, no, because when you cram information, people are not going to remember probably 99% of what you said. But if you tell a good story that really gives the point that you want to give across, then they will remember and they will remember you because in all likelihood, yours is going to be very different to other people that are presenting in their five minutes. Yeah, and there's a lot of science too that when you when someone shares a story and it, and it's a bit of a personal story it, it, and I'm going to say personal it's not deep and dark but it's just sharing something about themselves. You not only have a connection to the story but you actually have a stronger connection to the storyteller. Yeah. So it's almost like you're starting to strengthen relationships. I um I actually did a, I've done a lot of work with a particular professional service firm and the reason they wanted me to work with stories is because they said they initially they did it for a leadership role. So how do they roll out their values and strategies internally? But then I started to work with all the um uh, partners and the sales people because they said when they go into pitch for work, they know they get the same, you know, allocated 90 minutes or whatever to pitch. Their competitors are coming in straight for them or straight after them and they go, we know we're probably pitching 95% of the stuff we're pitching is the same. And they said the only thing that will um, distinguish us is the stories we tell that helps people build a connection with us. So after the meeting or after the pitch, they're sort of walking away going, hmm, they seemed really good. I want to work with them. And then exactly. they'll justify why they're the best, yeah. you know, the supplier. Look at it, yeah, is, is you're engaging your the emotional brain together with the rational brain. And when you engage the emotional brain, then you're creating a connection, which doesn't happen on the purely rational brain. Yeah, yeah. So. And look, you know, again, all this research to show the brain, we're, we're emotional beings mm -hmm. and the way we make decisions, we make emotional decisions and we justify it on logic. So mm -hmm. you still need all the logic. Mm -hmm. You know, anyone in traditional sales roles will tell you people buy an emotion and rationalise their decision on logic. And whether you're buying a new pair of shoes or the latest iPhone or you're buying into a strategy or a change or a company purpose or a company values or culture, you were doing that. Your people are doing that emotionally and that, yes, yes, make sure it logically makes sense. But what we tend to happen is we try to get them engaged in that through logic and we stay on logic and we lead on logic and then we get really frustrated they don't get it. Exactly. Or, or, they, exactly. Can't, or they can't remember the values. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, maybe communicate values through stories, not bullet points. There's exactly. a thought. <laughs> exactly. If you really want people to engage with it. And I think in conflict situations as well, what we tend to do when we're in a conflict is each party to the conflict engages on the facts. You know, what I did or what I said or what needs to happen or what didn't happen. And actually, if you can first of all engage by uh, connecting on a relationship level, building the relationship and understanding what's really important to us, why are we having this conversation, then we can take it to the next level and, and hopefully and possibly resolve the conflict a lot easier. A lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So tell us, let's get practical. Tell us, what are the skills? And I know you also talk about the five types of stories. So I'd love to hear about that. What are the skills to storytelling? Well, I think it's, it's some of the things we spoke about before. It's it's been clear on on the type of story, on the type of message you want to communicate. Um, I, I truly believe that as a leader, so if you're trying to lead change, your personal stories can be the most powerful. Um, and then it, it then it is get finding the right story for the right message, and and doing you know doing all the things we spoke about, like keeping it succinct, um, starting in a way that's not rambling, like you said at the start. You know, people going off. It was this road on was here and it was near the freeway. I was like, people have turned off before you've even started your story yeah. um, and ending it in a way that people get it, but you don't want to be telling them. So you don't want to be ending your story with the moral of the story is. Uh, would it be useful if I gave you an example of, yes. of a leader that's, yes. um, let me try to think of, I, I'm going to give you this good example because I know a, a, your clients, a lot of leaders and um, trying to communicate change and, and, and everything and CEOs. So I, um, I do, a, a, the vast majority of my work is I go into organisations and I work with the leaders and how they bring their culture alive through stories, so their values or behaviours. And so one of the, I worked with a company and one of their values was integrity. 
So I take people through the process of going, okay, so one of your values is integrity. So what does integrity mean to you? So, you know, they break it down. This, this woman was Anne. She goes, oh, integrity means telling the truth. Okay, great. What else does it mean? Um, it means if you say you're going to do something, do it. Okay, great. What else does it mean? And, th- and this is a process I've taken through too because mm-hmm. <laughs> it's amazing how many times people go, oh, hmm, I'm not sure. I haven't really thought of our values that much before. So, and then, you know, so I keep drilling down and, and she says, Said, uh, what it really means to me is doing the right thing all the time, not just when it suits us, right? She goes, so I think we're pretty good at doing the right thing when it suits us, not so much when it doesn't. And she said, it's a little bit like that saying, do the right thing even if no one's watching. Mm-hmm. So so now she's clear on the message. So I sort of say, pick one of them. You know, don't try to find a story that comes up with telling the truth, do what you say you're going to do, do the right thing all the time, just exactly. pick one. So she yes. picked doing Three the right thing. Things. And, and also just to point that out, like when we talk about something like integrity, it's really important to get clear what does this mean for you because it does mean different things to different people. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And look, uh, you see a lot of companies, and I know they have to say one of our values in integrity and this sort of what it means, but you need to give your, your people the space to say what does it mean to you. Yeah. And and I find taking them through this process, well, ultimately we're trying to find a story but even that process of saying what does it mean to you what does it mean to you it's the first time they've actually stopped and thought about what it means to them so okay so we go through the process of being really clear and you're right so they're three different messages so you need three different stories so even if you look at a, something like a value of integrity you could have two or three stories to communicate what that means so this, this is the story and and I'll, I'll try to I'll do it as Anne did it and I'll try to bring in a lot of the tips and techniques that I and the framework that I teach. Okay. So, um, and, and I might say to you, Daphne, and your, on your listeners, just pretend that I'm your new manager <laughs> and in one of the first meetings we have, I share this story with you. So, just as I'm sharing the story, just sort of think, Jay, what what would this do for you? What would this tell you about your new leader? What would it tell you about the culture she's trying to create or stuff like that? Okay. Okay, so here's the story. Here's what she, here's what Anne would say. She was in the early 60s. My dad was a professional swimmer and um, he reached the point in his career that he actually tried out for the National Swim Squad. And on the day of the meet, he was apparently winning his race and he got to the end to do the tumble turn, but he slightly misjudged the wall. And so he... It was way before, it was 60s, it was way before technology. They didn't have sensors in the wall and they had judges, but he knew with all that splashing and kicking, they probably knew, they wouldn't know if he touched the wall or not. So, But he had to make a split-second decision. Does he go back and touch the wall or does he just keep going? And he decided to go back and touch the wall. Now, you don't really recover from a, a swimming race when you go back and touch the wall, and he didn't. He never placed. He never, ever made the national swim squad. And I would always ask Dad, do you must, are there must be days you regret going back to touch the wall? And he always would say, I've never regretted going back and touching the wall because if I didn't go back and touch the wall, I would have to spend the rest of my life knowing I did the wrong thing. And I'm sharing this with you because it reminds me of our value integrity. It's only a matter of time before we come across our own go back and touch the wall moment. I invite you to consider what my dad would do. Mm-hmm. What does that story do for you? What does that story tell you about your new manager? Like it, it sort of, to me, it sort of goes, this isn't a company value to her. This was a value she was raised with. Um, it sort of creates that culture of she's not creating a win at all cost culture. She is truly believes that we need to do the right thing. Um, you know, it's I often I ask. Her DNA. It's, it's part of who DNA. she is. Yeah. It's, it is she is. Um, you know, to me, a lot of uh, when I ask people in my workshop, how does that feel? Everyone goes, I, like, I, I want to work for her. Mm-hmm. Instant trust and respect. Um, she has high integrity. People go, she has really high integrity. So it's through the story she shows that. I think the story is also subtly saying this is the standard I hold myself to and the subtle message is it's also the standard I expect of you is the subtle. But can you see it's a subtle message? I um, Anne, Anne probably did my training workshop about 10 years ago and I still see her on a regular basis. So, you know, we try to catch up about once a year or so. And she has told me that 
every single person that comes and works for her, she tells that story. And she said in her own words, she knows the heavy lifting it does. And so she goes, it gets to the point where we need to make a decision between let's say A and B. And she goes, the conversation will start going down the lines of, well, technically we don't have to do A. Legally, we're not obliged to do A. And she says, someone will then say, this is our go back and touch the wall moment. Uh What's the right thing to do? And she goes, everyone goes, well, B is clearly the right thing to do. And she'll go, well, B is clearly what we'll do. So to me, when we talk about values in actions, you can't bring your company values alive. You can't bring your own individual values alive without the stories you share about them. Now, now of course, you've got to do them. Of course, you've you've got to live them as well. Um, There's got to be congruence, but it's I think without stories values and purpose statements and mission statements just remain words on a page or words on a wall then they just stay there and I love how with this story um, she was able to create a language around their value so they can actually just say this is our go back and touch the wall moment and everybody knows what they mean and here's also an example of an intensely personal story that has significant meaning for everybody in the business. So I love that example that you've shared because I think it's so important. And what it brings to mind for me is uh, I sometimes work with my leaders and their teams on creating a user manual for their for their own, how they show up and kind of their likes and dislikes, their, their strengths and blind spots. And it helps people to know each other, how to communicate better and also how to and be aware and hold each other accountable on the blind spot parts. But I'm thinking I've never included a story because I think a story like you've just shared about the touch the wall moment is a personal story. So just like Anne said, she shares it with every new recruit. I have CEOs who share their user user manuals with every new recruit. It would be awesome to share a defining story in that user Mm -hmm. manual because it kind of grounds who I am through a story and then you can go into the you know details of what it means and what it looks like so I think that's a really really powerful example that you've shared with us yeah it is it's very powerful and and still she's actually changed companies several times she now works for Salesforce and um, she just she uses the same story because even if it, even if integrity is not a company value it's one of her values but you exactly. know the company will probably have a value like honesty or something yeah. and so it's she just honesty or do the right yeah, thing yeah and, yeah and it's yeah. a really good story it's a really really good yeah. story. so that brings to mind what if someone just sits for a minute and thinks and goes but I don't know if I have any good stories I don't know if I have a touch of the wall moment story yeah so a lot of people do so look again when I run my training a lot of people I just don't have any stories I'm just normal so first of all I say normal (laughs) normal is good um you know you don't that you don't like they sort of go nothing really great's happened to me nothing really bad happened to me I get that that's fine because the normal the day-to-day stuff is what we relate to um so I I always sort of go once you're clear on the message uh sometimes the story comes, it can come easier. So there's a, look, there, there are a couple of things I do. One of the things I suggest is people with a, like a bit of blank piece of paper write down everything that's happened to meet them in their life and, um, and they're not going to use them all and they're not going to remember everything. But you just go, well, how could I use that? What, what, what sort of message could that be? And so sometimes you start with this is the message I want to communicate. For example, this is I want to communicate our purpose or our strategy or our values. So you've got the message and you, and you try to find the stories and you just go, look, where, where have you experienced something like this? And I, and I always do push people to go outside of work. You're going to have – our default is to share work-related stories. That's our default. And look, there's nothing wrong with them and you can still do them. But the really exciting, the really engaging ones are the ones that have got nothing to do with work. Exactly. (laughs) You know, they're they're the ones, you know, you're sharing a story when you got in trouble off your mum, you know, or you, you know, you you stole money from your mum when you were two to 12 or something they're the ones that that are really engaging and people really respond to so first of all we all have stories we're just thinking no one would be interested in yeah. them or they're not yeah. they're not and, big enough yeah but, what seems but, normal but they to are us. yeah and what seems normal to us could be something a little bit different or a little bit quirky with our own yeah. flavor and our own life journey yeah i'm thinking that it's one, good, yeah 
I, I, I was going to say, yeah. I was, no, I was going to say, so normally the message starts first, but then sometimes once you realise the power of story, things will happen to you in your life and you just go, oh, yeah. I could use that. Like, oh, that's a great story about this or that's a great story about that. And you start to spot stories and just sort of keep track of them. It's true. And it could be the simplest stories. The simplest everyday stories can actually generate a level yeah. of inspiration or connection yeah, yeah. or whatever hey, I'll, it is. I'll get, just being aware get, of them. I'll give you another example because I think this is a great example of just how simple your stories mm-hmm. can be. Like it, you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be life-changing. Um about well, it was about a year ago because it was winter. It's winter, and um, my daughter, who was eight, uh, 19 at the time, she got me onto wine drops. I don't know if you've ever had wine drops, but you put, you put, they're in this little bottle, and you put five drops into your bottle of red. The idea is it's meant to reduce the the effect the preservatives have on you the next day. So it's just sort of meant to take, yeah. You mean less of a hangover? Less of a hangover is literally (laughs) what it's meant to do, right? And and especially with red wines because red wines tend to have a lot of preservatives in them. So anyway, it was a Friday night. It's, um, it was the middle of winter. I just, you know, lit the fire and I opened up a bottle of Shiraz and I put the five drops in and I pour myself a glass and Alex a glass. And then, you know, later Alex goes to refill our, our um, and she she's in the kitchen with the bottle and she goes, Mum, you didn't put these in the wine, did you? And she's holding up the wine drops and I go, yes, why? And she goes, you know, they're not wine drops, they're eye drops. And she's going, you probably poisoned us. And so my first reaction was, who was the idiot that left eye drops right next to the red wine bottle? That was my first reaction. But then my second reaction, because it's because it's someone else's fault, someone not else's mine. Fault, yeah. But my second reaction was, well, there's a funny little story. How could I use that? So I automatically think, what message could I do? And so I go... Oh, that would be a great me- a great story around assumptions, how we all make assumptions. Like I I assumed they were wine drops because they were next to the wine bottle and, and they looked similar to the um, wine drops. I, I did not even read the label. I didn't even read the label. Mind you, I kid you not, if I, even if I had read the label, on the eye drops, the label said blink, relief in every blink. And I reckon on a Friday night, I just would have read that as drink, relief in every <laughs> drink. <laughs> That's just awesome. <laughs> but, but what I do, what I do, I've actually got a journal and I write, um, you know, eye drops, wine drops, assumptions. Oh, okay. So no. now if I ever needed to give, you know, a message around, assumptions or the consequences of making assumptions i could share that little story i love that i love that you also keep track because i think we can also very easily forget our stories so i can relate to both sides of what you said but i'm noticing here is that there are two ways to come up with stories one is um things happen to you and you immediately thinking oh that's interesting how can i use this Or, or you make a connection in your brain to something that's important to you and you want you realize that there's a story there and I do send out an email every single week with some thought and it always is relating to something that happened to me, you know, an experience, a story, an event, something that I've read and I want to turn it into something to think about. So that's the one side. The other side is actually, as you mentioned before, we have a strategy, we have a purpose, we have values within the business or the organization and we want to make them come alive. We want to engage people with those values through stories. So how do we find the stories that fit? So that's the other way. And something that strikes me as a really good question to ask is that what's meaningful to you about that value? Why Mm. is it so important? And even there's that exercise of the five whys where you just ask, why is this important? Why is that important? Why is that important? And then you really dig into the root of something that makes it particularly important and meaningful to you. And that's bound to be a, a story, a personal It's bound story. to be a story. It, it, it's, I, I love what you said there. Normally when you do ask those five whys and why is it important, why is it important, you normally get to the fourth and fifth and they will go, well, you know why? Because at, when we were growing up, exactly. my mum and, and, and there and you there's go, your there's story. the story. There's your story. There's so, the story. Yeah, I love the five whys exercise and definitely something to practice, to start practice if people want to think about that uh, that uh, whole idea of how do we make the concepts that we talk about come alive with stories? How do we engage people through stories? 
So, mm. Gabrielle, before we tie up, I know there's something about you doing a stand-up comedy that I definitely want to hear about. So, can you tell us that story? And then maybe just uh, we'll we'll do some ending with what you want to share with our audience. Uh, okay, <laughs> so tell I can't us about believe. what made you do stand-up comedy. How did you do it, and why? <laughs> that, that 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 question's come out of the blue. I, I did do stand-up comedy, so it's one of those things. I'm um, you it's know, besides you do writing regularly. Oh, I thought it was no, kinds of, oh. no, no, no. No, 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 no. It's not something. It, it was. It was a once-off. It's um That's because brave. That's the, brave. Bes- I first of all have to put this on the table. Very, very. Yeah, brave. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. Um. So besides writing, I mean, literally, I write books and I teach and I'm a keynote speaker. So I'm a keynote speaker and I love. Um, you know, I do. I do think if you can educate and entertain an audience then it's, it's a lot better than just educating them. Okay. And I, I do, I've often had um, corporate audiences come up and say to me, have you ever thought of being a stand-up comic because you're really funny? And part of me goes, <laughs> and it was just like, well, I, I would always have loved to do one stand-up comedy gig. So so part of me goes, I there's a there's a technique to writing a good story. There's actually a really, te- and I, and I teach that. But there's also a technique to humour. There's also a technique to writing a good joke. And mm. and I don't know that. Mm-hmm. So I actually did a stand-up comedy course that went for five mm-hmm. nights and um, to learn the art of, of crafting and constructing a good joke. It ended in a stand-up comedy gig, wow. so you had to prepare for this gig. So it was a real, it was really fun, and I had a whole heap of um, friends oh, there to support Absolutely. me. And I and I did, uh, you know, the amount of work you have to put in. It actually reminded me of a story. The amount of work you got to put in to create that little two-minute story is a lot of work. Yeah. Just like the amount of work I had to put in for a five-minute comedy gig was unbelievable, um, but really good. And I can use the humor, but I people people said are you gonna flip to being a stand-up comedian I go no first of all (laughs) two things you don't get paid as much as a corporate Uh. speaker that's for sure but the other thing is if you go to see a comedian you expect them to be funny Mm -hmm. people come and see me when you go to a conference a business conference and you see speakers you don't expect them to be funny (laughs) And they only it have really to helps. be, it does help, but the, you only have to be slightly funny yeah, at true. those things. Yeah. And people come up going, oh, my God, you're hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like, so when you're expecting I'm, people to be funny, then it's a completely different ball Yeah, game. so I'm going I'm to stick to being a keynote speaker but <laughs> make it really, really entertaining because then it's such a surprise to people that people are going, oh, my God, that's the funniest keynote I've ever heard oh, in my life. And you go, good. Lovely. That's lovely. I love going to a keynote where I've laughed the whole time because actually yeah. you're learning so much more because you're enjoying and laughing and engaging your emotions. And I just laugh at that as well because my kids always tease me that I'm really not funny. But I know that I'm funny when I, you know, you, you're always funniest when you don't really mean to be, when it just comes out because it just happens in the moment kind of thing. So Yeah, and, and don't listen to your kids. Your kids are never going to, your kids are never going to go, oh, you're really I'm funny, funny. Mum. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's lovely. Thanks so much. Okay, so what what do you want to what is the message that you want to leave our listeners with? What what tell us where they can find you? And we'll, okay, of look, course we'll put I, all of that in the show notes as well. Yeah, absolutely. So look, the best place you can connect with me on LinkedIn, of course, but on my website's probably the best place to go. I think if this has sparked your interest about, oh, how would I get, how would I even start thinking about storytelling? I have a starter kit on my website. It's free. It's a seven day storytelling starter kit. And it sort of is what it says it is. It lasts for seven days. You get an email from me with a little video and it's just to help you get started. So, um, you can do, you know, just go to my website and you'll see Starter Kit. I reckon that's the good place to start. To start, there's there's a lot of you know free stuff on my website, white papers and and resources and access to all my books and. Okay. And what is your website? Just say it. So I mean, like oh, it will be in the show notes, but you're welcome. GabrielleDolan.com. Awesome. <laughs> that's it's probably important. I do mention the website <laughs> if I'm directing people to the website. So go ahead and check uh, Gabrielle out there. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Final words, what is your message to our listeners? What what do you want them to do, think, feel um, as they leave this conversation? Have the courage to be personal and have the courage 
to share stories because that is what people are looking for in their leaders. And whoever said works, works, personal, personal, don't mix the two is an idiot. I love that. I love that. I'm going to put that as your quote, Gabrielle, because I actually so agree with it. But whoever said work is work and personal is personal is an idiot. That's it. That's a quotable (laughs) quote. (laughs) Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Wonderful to have you on the show. And uh, yeah, just have an awesome day. Thank you. This wraps up another episode of Leadership Live. Thank you for joining us today. And now let's continue the conversation. Do you have any questions, comments, or suggestions? Connect with me on LinkedIn or head on to my website at daphnahorovitz.com where you can download a free sample of my new book, Weekly Habits for Extraordinary Leaders. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to share it with a friend so that I can continue to reach and support leaders just like you. So tune in next week to Leadership Live where talented people become extraordinary leaders.